endowments of goods initially, and um, but common rules. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Um, and um, and they're going to interact. And what you get is a interesting sorts of interactions. You can model things that aren't easily modeled with uh, traditional linear modeling techniques. While, while working on this agent-based modeling, I came across uh, Alexander Stepanoff and Daniel Rose's books, From Mathematics to Generic Programming. And I was very much inspired by this. What is this idea of generic programming? Um, well, first of all, Python is a great language for doing generic programming in. And uh, it, it has two of the key ideas. One of them is don't repeat yourself, which is what we're trying to do with generic programming. The second thing that really makes it a great platform for this is duck typing. Um, here's our duck. <laughs> so uh, object-oriented languages have polymorphism uh, built in, most of them. So if um, something is uh, of a list type, uh, if its ancestor is list, you can pass it anywhere that list is required as a parameter. Uh, in C++, Stepanoff wrote the C++ standard template library. What it allowed was that you could pass in things that weren't ancestors of a common type, as long as they supported the operations that were going on. So, at, for instance, if your function was going to use greater than and uh, the addition operator, then you could use a template, and any type that could have greater than and plus applied to it would work. It didn't, they, the parameter didn't all need to be ancestors of the same type. With Python uh, duck typing, that already works. So Python already gets us a ways towards generic programming. Um, This I put up because I noticed when people are doing very important presentations, they always had a long pause and a vote. I want to know that this is a very important presentation. I didn't want anyone to feel it wasn't. Um, so what Stepanoff and Rose do, they're inspired by abstract algebra, which is taking things like uh, ordinary arithmetic, ordinary algebra dealing with numbers, and abstracting from the fact we're dealing with numbers, and you could be dealing with, for instance, knots. You know, uh, mathematically represented knots, but on, you could envision them as knots in a piece of rope, and you can add knots. Um, so this operation of addition can be abstracted from how it applies to numbers, and can apply to anything that follows the rules of addition. And what Stepanoff and Rose are trying to urge programmers to do is think in these terms, these very abstract operations, and set down, a, a capture the pattern of the abstract operation, and then you can reuse it in many different coding situations. Um, so addition can apply to clocks and knots, not just integers or reals. Clock addition, of course, if it's nine and we add four, the answer is one, not 13. And knots, uh, we don't want to go into a discussion of uh, not addition and not algebra, but knots can be added as well. So uh, if we're writing, for instance, a summation function, what Alexander and uh, Stepanov and, and Daniel Rose are saying is we should handle, we should be able to sum anything where the objects follow the rules of addition, not just numbers where we add them in the way we're familiar with. Um, I touched on what agent-based modeling is uh, earlier. Basically, uh, it's an attempt to capture, it's, it's used often in social sciences, often in biology. Uh, for instance, people will model cells as agents and give the cell a set of rules. Then you set a bunch of cells going in an environment and say, what does their interaction amount to? Do we get some kind of, you know, the spread of a disease or some uh, spread of a cancer in this in 
this uh, environment of cells. So we want to code individual units and then have them interact and have some outcome emerge that may be surprising to us and see if following these simple rules we get this macro behavior. Um, uh, a good example is the movement of a flock of birds, right? So how do birds do this thing where they swirl around together in the air? Well, it turns out that you could uh, model this by giving each bird fairly simple rules. Stay a certain distance off the right wing of this other bird. And if you give them simple rules like this, you'll get flocking behavior. Um, so this is the kind of thing agent-based modeling is trying to capture. Uh, some of the models we've implemented, this is a forest fire model where the black are burnt out trees, green are healthy, red are fires. Um, a very interesting example of this kind of modeling, Nobel Prize winner Thomas Schelling uh, did this. Uh, at first, his, his modeling technique was to take a chessboard and a bunch of coins and run his model on the chessboard. We can do it a little faster with somewhat bigger uh, sets of agents with a computer. Um, and he, he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, one, of his, uh, one of the things they cited was the fact, using this fairly simple model, where the agents had a rule, uh, Shelling's looking at segregated neighborhoods. And he's saying, does this mean everyone, you know, if we see largely segregated neighborhoods in the city, I mean, everyone wants to live in a segregated neighborhood where 100% of the people are the ethnicity, color, whatever of them. And what he demonstrated was that all you need is for people to have a preference for not being too much of a minority. So someone might, for instance, be fine if 40% of the people in the neighborhood are Irish like they are, right? And, but when it drops below that, they start to feel uncomfortable, I'm um, too small of a minority. That leaves those people to leave, and that drives it below 35%. Now the people who are happy at 36% start to leave, and that drives the percentage down to 29% of the people who had been happy at 30% leave. So without anyone having a preference for completely segregated neighborhoods, we can get them anyway. Uh, this is, uh, we have red and blue agents here, uh, and you just give them a, per, a minimum percentage. I want to see at least X percent blue around me, or I'm uncomfortable, and I go. And picking percentages fairly moderate, like 40 percent, you can wind up with a fully segregated city. So. This is an example of what you do in agent-based modeling. Create these software units, objects with simple rules, set them going, see what the result is. Uh, the process of generalization is interesting. My belief, it's not a good idea to start out with a broad uh, generalization and then try to generate your system from that. This is not the way mathematics uh, developed the generalizations that it deals with. It started out with very concrete problems. Where is the corner of your field? Um, how do we put up these stones to uh, you know, capture the sunrise on a particular day? And then gradually went through these increasing levels of abstraction. Uh, what didn't happen, um, sometimes people try to write software, it's as if mathematicians devised abstract algebra and then came to some peasant farmers and said, look, I think you could find a way to apply this to measure your fields. Uh, that's not what happened in mathematics. Uh, so what we've tried to do is build a bunch of agent-based models, sort of, uh, you know, we had certain commonalities that um, we, we had, we had agent that was going to act, we had an environment it was going to act in. But uh, with just those bare common features, we then built a bunch of models and then began looking for commonalities among them and gradually abstracted out of the concrete models uh, useful generalizations. Um, 
I don't want to go in too much into the uh, particular algebra, abstract algebraic uh, structures we're using, um, but uh, in abstract algebra, what they've done is built, uh, starting from a set, you can add axioms one at a time and build up structures that uh, about which you can prove more and, and which you have knowledge of further operations but that are more restricted. So we've been looking at what people have done in abstract algebra and trying to find some level of the abstractions that they've generated that will capture a number of the models we're using. Um, so uh, the forest fire model, for instance, is the abstract algebraic structure known as a uh, group. Um, the segregation model uh, turns out to be a module. What, it ad what that adds is there's multiplication by uh, elements. A, a group has elements that can be added and produce other members of the group. Uh, <coughs> The module adds the idea of a second set that can be multiplied by the group members and produce um, uh, another, uh, uh, another group member. In fact, what you usually are doing is taking a real number and multiplying it by something like a vector. So from the models we built, we began thinking about what, what kind of abstract algebraic structures could this model be taken to represent? Um, what we've decided to call the general thing we were doing was a prehension, and here the idea we're capturing is that in all these models, basically you have an agent with some internal state. It's got a goal, a representation of how it's feeling, how its utility is, uh, whether uh, it's uh, in a pile too high in the sand pile model, and then it somehow gets a view of its environment. Alfred North Whitehead called these prehensions. Um, we couldn't think of a better word, and Whitehead had already used it, so it was out there. So we said, OK, we'll take Whitehead's term. Um, so I'm in a situation, I have a certain endowment of goods that are giving me a certain utility. And I run into this fellow, and I see he has other goods, and I can trade the goods. So I have my, a prehension of my own state. I, see his state and see what goods he has, and I decide if I give him an apple and he gives me an orange, I'll be better off. Um, okay, skip that. So, we have some basic, so looking at this in terms of abstract algebra gives us some rules. For instance, uh, we have closure. A prehension and a prehension will always give us another prehension. Um, associativity, um, it doesn't matter what order, uh, how, we group, how we group these things. So we can take prehension A plus B plus C, and that'll equal A plus B plus C. Um, there's an identity element, so there's a null prehension we didn't see anything in the environment of interest to us, so our state doesn't change, basically. Um, so for when we get up to modules, for instance, uh, or abelian groups, we add commuti commutativity, uh, uh, modules add invertibility. Okay, so this is basically, as I said, an agent's view of its environment and of its own internal state, uh, null prehension is nothing is interesting in the environment. I'm not going to change. Um, invertibility, so if you have a tendency, for instance, a tendency to smoke, uh, but then there's a smoking ban, that will cancel out that and set, uh, will invert it and you'll get back the null prehension. Essentially nothing will happen because the ban will cancel out your tendency. So I'm showing you how we can apply these abstract algebraic concepts two agents. Um, intensification, we want to um, uh, take my, my tendency to want to um, move to a different neighborhood 
and perhaps some new factor enters in, and that, that, that tendency will become stronger. Um, so what we've actually implemented so far has been very interesting. These were existing models, and we sought out these abstract structures in them. And we've been able to achieve 40, 50 percent reduction in the amount of code in these models. And this is just starting out. Our feeling is we're going to find many more models that we can fit into these structures. So what we're trying to do, the way these are usually coded, the forest fire model is hand coded so that uh, trees see it. If there's a tree next to them on fire, they catch on fire. Uh, after they are on fire for one turn, they transition to the state burned out. Then they stay in that for 20 turns or something, and then regrow. Uh, but uh, analyzing this, we saw that this is a Markov chain. It's, we can take a uh, transition matrix. And if you have lightning strikes, and usually these are coded you know, in the environment level, we pick a random tree and set it on fire. But what we can do with a, a transition matrix is just set a probability that if you're healthy, green and growing, if there's a small probability you'll catch fire, and that's like a lightning strike. So we don't need to specifically make code or have a lightning strike. It just enters into the tra transition matrix. And um, a, you know now you can set that as a parameter uh, when you start the model. Um, The, um, the number of turns it's going to take you from burned out to healthy is also, uh, you don't need to count turns. You can just set, if it's 20 turns, just set a 5% probability. And on average, at 20 turns, you'll start regrowing. And that, sh that really won't change the behavior of the model. In any case, we've had success so far hunting for these abstract algebraic structures behind these models. Doing so has enabled us to have a great deal of code reuse already. And having found these structures, we're sure as we implement further models that will get a good deal more code reuse. So uh, in any case, I, I recommend uh, uh, stepping off in Rose's book to you. I found it fascinating, and we've had good luck uh, trying to implement their ideas. Thank you.